Hi, my name's Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 27 of the Gaming Rules Podcast. In this show, I've got all the usual games that I've been playing, and then I'm joined by Jeff Engelstein later on for an interview. Thanks to everybody who posted questions for Jeff on the BGG Guild. I'll be going through them later with him. If you're a listener and not a member of the Guild, then please sign up and subscribe, and more importantly, please contribute, especially if I talk about a game that you like or don't like. would love to hear what you think. The Guild is over on Board Game Geek, and it's Guild number 2258. Also, later in this episode, I announce the winner of the competition from last time, who's won £30 of games of their choice from the sponsors of the show GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. What Paul has played. I'll start off with a game that's been on my list to play for ages, which is Orleans, or Orleans, which I got to play at the local games club in Exeter. I first saw this game at Essen 2014, and it really did look at the, like the kind of game that I'd like to play. But it was a case of, you know, too many games and not enough time to play them all. And I was also put off a little bit by, by the thinness of the cardboard, especially when you're you know, putting those chits into a bag and shuffling them around. I thought that's not going to work. Now, since then, it's been picked up by Tasty Mineral Games and they've done a, a nicer version of the game with thicker cardboard. And I got given a copy as a gift from Games Law at the end of last year. And Chris came down to our local club and taught us how to play. So thanks to Chris for doing that. And I really did like the game. I, I kind of knew that I was going to like it but not as much as I actually did. I like the mechanics of the game. The theme's not really there, but I'm more of a mechanics person anyway. But uh, yeah, I, I think I enjoyed it more than I was expecting and look forward to playing that again. Then on the Friday, three of us got together and we tried Discoveries. This is the dice game version of Lewis and Clark. We, and Discoveries was one of the big buzz games that I remember from Gen Con last year. I got a review copy from Estevium, so I will be doing a review of it at some point, uh, but I need to play it a bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I actually really liked it. It's one step up from a gateway game, so I wouldn't use it on non-gamers, but it isn't too complex, it isn't too long, and although it has dice, there's lots of decisions to make. And I do like the way that the grey dice work. So you've got these, these grey dice, which are kind of common, so when you buy them, effectively you're buying extra workers, they're not actually yours permanently, and the grey dice can move around between the players. And it, that, that's the interesting mechanism that I liked about it. And, and yeah, it did play. For the time it took to play, I really enjoyed it. Then, Andy requested 504, which I will never turn down a game of. However, he wanted me to step outside of my comfort zone and try a new module. Now, Ben was with us, and he hadn't played before, so I was a little nervous about picking a world which, which might not work for a first-time player and give them a bad impression of the game. But we took the risk, and we chose 618. Module 8 is not something that I've used before, but this combination worked really well. We were building roads for victory points, picking up and delivering for money, but the difference is, with the other pick up and deliver options, is that the cities don't actually have the goods themselves. You're not transporting goods from one city to another. You've actually got to build plants out in the countryside. They produce the goods. You then pick them up, take them to the cities and sell them for cash. It's a really good combination of modules. And I definitely play this, this setup again if it weren't for the fact that I still have 495 other combinations to try out. And then on the Saturday, an impromptu visit from Dan, a friend of mine, caused 504 to hit the table again because I was talking to him about it and he sounded really fascinated. So this time, I, I tried yet another module, bringing military into the game, because I've not used module 4 yet. So we played module 864, and it kind of didn't work for two players at all. I do want to try this module again with other players, just to see if it does work, uh, but with two players it definitely didn't. Now, the module worked, don't get me wrong, I won't go into the full details, I posted about it on Board Game Geek. but yeah, 864 didn't really work with two players. On the Tuesday, I got to try another game that's been on my list for a long time, which is Fire in the Lake. Now, I've wanted to try one of the coin series of games for ages. I'm a Euro gamer. I'm not a war gamer. Back in the 80s, I had all these really long, complex games with, you know, hexes and counters and everything else, and they were massively complicated, and I didn't really get to play them that much. And I'd heard that the coin series is a sort of modern, more updated version of these old style war games. So I was really, really looking forward to it. I've also got a bit of a thing about the, the Vietnam War. I just like the dynamics of, of how it works. And I'm happy to say that Fire in the Lake, I absolutely loved it. Now, I'm not gonna have the time to get seriously into this game and play it repeatedly to get to know, you know all the intricacies of it. 
but it really did work. So hats off to the designers. Um, a guy called Sean came down to the club and taught me how to play, and it was really good. I was really nervous going into the game that this is going to be a massively complicated game. I'm really tired. I'm not going to get it, and I'm not going to enjoy it. And actually, I, I loved it. The game was pretty streamlined. Some of the rules were elegant. I would definitely play it again. Really enjoyed that. On the Friday, we're on a bit of a roll here because I got to try another game that I've been wanting to try for ages, which is Fields of Arla. So uh, I hope Travis is listening because he'll be very proud of me. I finally played Fields of Arla and I really enjoyed that as well. It was less complex than I thought it might be. I was expecting something fairly, uh, yeah, I don't know, more complicated than what it was. Not that that's a bad thing. I really enjoyed the game. I thought the mechanisms in it were great. Uh, thanks to Ben for teaching me how to play. I didn't win, but I wasn't trying to win. I was just trying to fiddle around with the game and do various things to try and learn the mechanics. So yeah, really enjoyed that. After we'd played Fields of Arla, we knocked out a quick two-player game of Through the Ages just to finish the night off, which is another game that I'd never turned down the game of. So that was a great gaming night, Fields of Arla and Through the Ages. Gaming Rules News. Since the last podcast, some of you have been wondering where the Galaxy Trucker videos are, because I said that I'd done the first two. Well, they're with CG now, and they're going to choose when they get released, so hopefully something on that soon. In the meantime, I've been working pretty much full-time on the Vinyos videos. Now, Vinyos is going to be launching on Kickstarter at the end of January, so I've got a deadline for this, but I'm really looking forward to releasing these videos as I've been putting a lot of work into them, tried a new style, and I'm really liking the way that they're looking. But we'll see what people think. Also, finally, I've been contacted by Space Cowboys and I've helped with put together the new Time Stories rulebook. So for those people who have helped me sort of work out some of the rules of the game and get some answers to the official questions, then I've put all of that and I've tried to, you know, make the new rulebook uh, basically a little clearer than the old one because there were some ambiguities. So hopefully they'll be releasing that soon. Special guest. Right, so joining me on the show this week is Jeff Engelstein, all the way from New Jersey, on the other side of the pond. For those who don't know Jeff, he's the host of the Ludology podcast, which has been running since 2011, I think, uh, I, which I was lucky enough to be invited onto as a guest last year. He's also known for running the Game Tech segment on the Dice Tower since 2007, and also the designer of Space Cadets and Survive Space Attack. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. And recently you posted to Twitter to say you wanted to give something back to the community and appear on other people's podcasts. Yes, it's a uh, thinly veiled publicity tour under the guise of altruism, yes. Which I, I think I might need to borrow that idea, because that, that's quite <laughs> a good idea. Um, now, outside of gaming, obviously I, I did look up a bit of information about you. You're one of those very clever people. You studied at MIT, you've got degrees in physics, electrical engineering and ancient history. Is that three different degrees, or was that the degree? Uh, physics was one degree, and then there was a second degree, which is a combination of electrical engineering and ancient history, which was kind of a program that MIT was offering to encourage people to major in the humanities. They were offering joint degrees between humanities and uh, engineering disciplines. So. Right. Yeah, because electrical engineering and ancient history, I imagine there's not much crossover there. No, no, sadly, no. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing, for, the, for those people who, uh, you know, want to know a bit more about you outside of gaming, is that you're the president of an engineering design and manufacturing firm and co-owner of a software company that develops inspection software for state and local governments. Yes. Um, Which is quite impressive. Yeah, I'm a busy guy, yeah. I, I, uh, I try to very carefully manage my time and uh, it's, uh, but I, you know, look, it's, it's, I really enjoy, you know, engineering and design and I find it's a, a really, cr it allows me to express creativity um, in, in a similar way that I do with, uh, with game design as well. Yeah, so it's not just a job that you go to that pays the bills. You're actually really interested in that sort of stuff as well, which mm -hmm. helps. So it brings me on to my first question, which is an obvious one based on what we've just talked about. Is how do you feel that you're out of your gaming life with regards to your education and work, how, do, how does that help you with your gaming life, not just in design, but in, in the play in the games as well? Uh, well, you know, one of the things with, you know, science and engineering is it's very much about, you know, puzzle solving in a way, you know, you've got a problem and, you know, all of engineering and, and science is dealing with constraints and there's, you can't do everything that you want to do, whether it's cost or size or power consumption or whatever it is, there's, there's always limitations that you have to work around. And when, 
you know, I'm doing a game design, I bring that same kind of mentality. Um, uh, you know, I recently actually gave a talk about comparing game design and engineering, and, and I think that there's tremendous parallels, and game design is really a form of engineering because you're you're constrained by how much the game is going to cost, how much brain power the players are going to be able to expend in learning rules and intricacies of rules, and how graphically you're going to design things to make it easy for people to understand it's, and smooth to play. And there's a lot of trade-offs there, and... You know, I just find it very fulfilling um, from a creative creativity standpoint of being able to to work through those problems and juggle all those those different things to try to to get to the point that I want to get to on the game. Uh, plus, at work, I've got a uh, a really nice uh, 3D printer and a large format printer, which also come in really handy <laughs> which, for printing out boards or game components or what have you. So, yes, I have to admit, since I left full time employment, my access to an A3 color laser printer has been severely missed. Yes. But uh, these these things have to happen. So I mean, one one of the things that you touched on there is is when I'm teaching a game to people or or just playing a game with people, and they say, "Oh, I don't have enough actions to do everything I want." I'm like, "Ding!" That's one of my favourite parts about the kind of games that I play is that there is not enough time for you to do everything that you want to do, and you've got to be efficient with those actions to get effectively, you know, as many victory points as you can, or or whatever it is you're trying to do. So it's interesting when you're saying that it, within engineering itself, you've always got those limitations of, you know, either cost or power or, or whatever. Right, right. So there are similarities. Yeah, and that's always an interesting trade-off from a design standpoint because you want to, you know, sometimes you want to give the players a feeling of abundance. I mean, you don't always want to starve the players where they're sitting there, you know, and there's all this cool stuff and they're not able to do it because they just don't have enough time or actions or whatever to set up this really cool combo or, or it only happens once every 100 games. So, but but at the same time, you don't want to just spill everything out onto the table and say just do whatever you want. So it's it's always challenging as a designer to find that balance point to give the players the experience that you want to give them for that for for whatever you're trying to do. Okay, so we've had a few questions in on my board game Geek Guild, which I'm going to go to now. The first one is from Simon Neal, which is about the idea for Space Cadets. Were you watching an episode of Star Trek at the time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, actually, that goes way back. I was playing, and I, I I really should look up the exact year, but, you know, back in the 80s or 90s, there was a Star Trek role-playing game. Yeah, I've got it. That came out, which which had as part of the combat system, for when you were doing ship-to-ship combat, there were actually little instrument panels, little display panels for the different players that they did different stations on the ship. Right. Uh, but it wasn't really done particularly well, and it wasn't, you know, a, a huge focus of the game. Uh, uh, to to whatever extent, and but that idea of having the players do different things really stuck with me. Um, and originally, I wanted to do it as a computer game, um, and actually put together a, a spec. And I spoke to uh, I, I had a meeting with a, a company. Uh, I knew some people in the video game business, and I kind of laid out the whole thing about how I wanted to do kind of mini games for each player to do it. And they were like, "Oh, so you mean like Yahoo Puzzle Pirates?" <laughs> which I had never, ever heard of and right. went back and looked at and I was like, oh yeah, this is really that's, similar. That's nice. yeah. So so I went back and said, maybe I could do this as a board game. Okay. And, uh, you know, it took like maybe another six or seven years after that because of other projects and things, but ultimately that was kind of how it all, all came together. Okay, so sticking with games that you've designed, uh, the Survive Space Attack game, if you look on Board Game Geek as who's designed it, it's not just you, it's you and family. Yes, so how did that come about? Uh, well, all the games, all the board games we've got out now have been done with one or more members of the family. Right. Uh, so our, uh, the first one was just with my son, and then Space Cadets was, was my son and my daughter both, and then Space Cadets Dice Duel was with just my daughter. Um, and um, it's, you know, it's for me, I always work much better in collaboration than by myself. Mm -hmm. Um just I, I know myself psychologically that it's very it's it's sometimes difficult for me to see projects through the end unless I've got somebody else uh, kind of you know also involved that can pick up the slack when I kind of you know lose energy and 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 vice versa you know and that's all parts of my life even like my exercise program I have to I play racquetball uh, for for most of my uh, workouts because if I have to just go up get up and do it on myself and you know get on the bike or or go out for a run I it's too easy for me to say no whereas if I yeah. know that you know, Mark's out there waiting for me. I'm going to get up and, yeah. and go. Um, so, you know, I and, and my kids are heavily into games. 
which has absolutely nothing to do with me, of course. No, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> but it must be it must be rewarding to not only have them play games with you, but to help you design games as well. It's great, you know, and yeah. and we would go on long car trips or whatever, and you know that that would always be something that we would talk about, much to my wife's chagrin. But um, you know, it's it's it was a way to you know communicate with the kids, and some a lot of people don't have. You know, you, you hear about people that t- tell me I don't know what to talk to my kids about or they just talk about sports or, you know, whatever. Um, but this was something that we could always bond over and, and, and communicate over. And so that was great. And I also wanted to give my kids the experience of creating something that could would go out into the world. Um, yeah. You know, I, I uh, designed video games when I was in high school and had published them and, and so learned that that lesson that, hey, I can make something and get it out there on a shelf. And for my kids to design something and then see it here in local stores and Barnes and Nobles and things like that has been tremendously fulfilling with them. And I hope we'll stay with them for their whole lives that this is something they can do. That's cool. So moving on to the next question, we've had this in from Tony Boydell, fellow game designer, and he wants to know what your opinion on the concept of legacy games is. I think it's really, really cool. Um, on the last uh, the Dice Tower year-end wrap-up show, uh, I, I we were talked about the year as a whole, and I kind of sort of declared it as a, a watershed moment in the idea of narrative in games. Um, and I think between uh, you know the legacy games, looking at time stories, um, looking at tragedy looper, you know I think there's so many different ways of telling stories with games now. Um, I, I think it's really exciting. You know, I think if I tell someone you're only going to be able to play this game 10 times or 15 times, I'm totally fine with that. Or yeah. even maybe once, you know, in the case of time stories. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, how many times do we really play games? At least me personally. I mean, each, you know, copy of my game, if I play a game five times now, that's a lot. Uh, so I think that habits have changed and, but, and it, it tremendously opens up the design space for designers. So I'm really, I'm really, really excited about it. It's the buzz thing at the moment, and I, I've sort of swayed on a num- number of sides of the fences about them, but there's no denying that they are popular based on current BGG rankings right. and, and what everybody's saying about Pandemic Legacy. Yeah, so, and uh, look, there's some movies that you're going to go see, you know, 50 times. You know, I can see Airplane or Monty Python yeah. and a Holy Grail. I can watch <laughs> over and over again. And there's some movies that are great, you know, like Schindler's List that I'm going to see once, you know, I'm not going to go back and watch that over and over again. And I think that games can have that same variety. There can be the perennial games and there can be, you know, the one shot experience games. I think there's room for for both. Cool. Okay. A question in from uh, Ben. He wants to know if it's true that anybody can come by your house anytime and play games. Uh, A a phone call in advance is appreciated, but yes. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I, I've had many people, uh, you know, reach out to me. Um, we just had a couple of guys in about six months ago, I think, from Australia that came in and they were visiting New York City and they reached out to me. And, um, you know, it happened to work out as a weekend. And I went into the city and met them and toured them around. And we went to some game stores, played some games. So, yeah. Uh, cool. And we have a big game party here a couple of days, a couple of times a year. And uh, we usually get between 50 and 100 people, depending on what's going on. So I, I, I like meeting people and and uh, sharing time with them. So if anybody's ever in the area, yep. just give you a Ever in New York, New Jersey, reach out. And if we can, I can't guarantee it, but you know, if we can make something work, then uh, absolutely. Cool. Uh, next question is in from a friend of mine, Lewis Holt. Um, and he wants to know if you're able to play a game for fun or do you find yourself constantly fixing it, assuming that there's something in the game that would need fixing? Are you able to switch off? Well... Well, he's 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 implying in his question that fixing it is not fun. True. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know every time I play a game, I will enjoy a game, but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm trying to understand how it works. But that's fun for me. I like taking things apart and understanding what's making them tick. So yeah. you know, it's you know, I I it, I'm still totally engaged in the game and trying to win and trying to piece it together. But at the same time, you know, I I, I like to tease those things out so that I can you know, integrate them into stuff that I'm doing or, you know, see things that I would want to avoid doing if I identify, you know, things that are making a game not work. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in a similar boat, you know, I'm, I'm involved in sort of minor development in a number of different games and, and I can't switch it off. So if I'm playing a game, 
if there's a part of the game which I think, oh, it's not quite working right, and it would work better if there were four tiles on display instead of three, yeah, I can't, I can't switch that off. I don't try to keep the thoughts to myself because nobody wants, right, you know, to play a game with this running commentary of, oh, it would be better <laughs> if it was like this. Which is my my kids are totally into doing that, especially my son. Right. You know, he's he's very harsh on on games and things, and he, you know, he's always looking for ways to improve them. So we always have yeah. it whenever we play any game. There's always like an hour long conversation afterwards about what could be done differently and things like that right okay so when when you're playing against your kids how competitive does it get is it like flipping the table competitive or just name calling or is it all all friendly uh well it's it's very very competitive in that we are all totally playing to win uh i have never let my kids win a game ever famously they would tell you that and they 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 laud me for that now uh but um you know we're not we don't get angry with each other and stuff like that. It's never gotten to that point. We get yeah, sometimes we good. get angry at the game, uh, but uh, but but we never get angry at um, uh, once playing Dungeon Lords. Uh, Brian almost uh, that that was the worst I've seen him when he almost flipped the table after he he like totally misunderstood the rules. Probably because I didn't explain them clearly about how your dungeon gets attacked and he like lost everything. And <laughs> he was really annoyed. Uh, so, um, but not not with each other. We're we're very good at walking. Well, that away. that's a larger game, isn't it? Build something and watch it get destroyed, and yes. then get upset yes. when it, it gets torn apart. <laughs> so, right. So, right. Next question in, is in from Mike, who does the Who Dares Rolls podcast, uh, and Mike knows that you're a Hearthstone player. Okay. And he wants to know what your opinions are on a virtual game versus physical. Which do you prefer? I think they both have advantages. Um, I I think that one of the things I like from gaming as a hobby is the social aspect of it. Um, And I think that board games have a real huge advantage over uh, video games in general and certainly games like Hearthstone about, um, uh, you know, in that way. I mean, I can gather a whole bunch of people around the table. We already talked about that. You know, I'm happy to meet different people and, you know, hang out with them and try different games and just, you know, interact with people that way. Um, In fact, the more I've gotten into gaming, the more I realize that board games in essence are, rather than the game itself, are kind of laying ground rules for social interaction between people, which is why I think that people like myself that are somewhat awkward in social interaction um, can gravitate towards those because it gives us a framework in which, you know, what what we can do and how we deal with people and stuff like that, as opposed to just free form of standing around a cocktail party. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, for, for things like Hearthstone, you know, if I've got 10 or 15 minutes to, to kill, it's it's a great little thing to do, but there's no social interaction. You know, there's six things I can say, and, you know, it's it's very anonymous. It's 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 a totally different type of experience in that sense. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loving Hearthstone myself, and I think one of the bits that I like about Hearthstone is the effort that they've put into making it look pretty, so it plays, it plays nice, it plays smooth, but the, the 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 certain effects of certain cards you cannot do in a in a physical game. So you know, right. unstable portal, summon a random minion. It just yeah. picks one, or, or you know, put one in things like that. And although that does add to the look element of the game and the randomness, I've had some absolutely thoroughly enjoyable games because of the way that certain things have come out and certain things have happened. So yeah, I think so. Yes, and I would also refer him to my. Uh hearthstone episode we actually interviewed the lead designer of hearthstone on ludology um i think in like march or april of last year i forget the exact episode number but that was a really good one all right okay so one of last year's episodes yeah i might go and listen to that myself okay um question in from keith shapley he wants to know which team do you want to win the super bowl uh (laughs) i don't have much of a of a of a uh a rooting interest at this point uh, but I, w- I would like to see uh, probably the Cardinals at this point just because they haven't done it in quite a while right okay uh, and on to a game related question he wants to know if the if the current rate of games that are being published is it sustainable are, are, is this here to stay or is it going to start dropping again um I think it's sustainable to a certain extent I mean I, I've famously been saying that you know kickstarter is is going to be imploding for you know I, I every year i predict that kickstarter will be imploding and every year it doesn't uh you know yeah. I, personally i you know i think as a publisher you're foolish if you don't take advantage of it and as a consumer you're kind of foolish if you do uh for the most part i i, I think mm-hmm. that it's you know that there's there's so many unproven products out there that people are spending money on. But, you know, I mean, given that, I, I think yeah. that, you know, the it's been shown in the marketplace that there's, you know, 
there, there's a demand for that. People want these kind of games. It's becoming, you know, the, the investment that you have to make in a game is decreasing as it becomes easier to do artwork, as it becomes, you know, uh, it, it becomes less expensive. There's more competition now. When you get stuff published, you can, the prices are, are lower. So, you know, the bar for entry is is less expensive. So it's easier for people to go out and, and make these, you know, a, a hundred piece run or 500 piece run or, you know, a couple thousand pieces or whatever. So I think it's going to continue. I think it's great. I think there's a lot of garbage out there but um i i think that the more stuff there is the more chance you have of those you know diamond in the rough appearing so i'm, I'm excited about the prospects for the future yeah i think the things that we've had you know the signs to me is in you know last year uh gen con america has outgrown its current venue and he's now having to do something different for this year uk mm-hmm. games expo has outgrown its current venue and we're now having to move into the nec essen is pretty much outgrown its current venue and it's just everything does seem to be growing and i remember yeah. talking to um anton from ffg at essen last year and we both felt that we're in a golden age at the moment we're in a case of uh, of, of massive growth and we we honestly couldn't say whether that growth was going to last one year two years five years ten years we don't know you know a- ask again in five or ten years time and we'll see where we are yeah, I don't know if the growth is gonna is gonna is the growth itself is sustainable, but probably the size of the market as it is right now is 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 seems to be sustainable to a certain yeah. extent. But yeah, you know, it's total. Look, I you know I've been playing games since 1975 or whatever. But you know, I mean, when we first were collecting Euro games, when Euro games first hit in the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, the the stuff was it was very hard to get here in the U.S. It was being imported, you know, and I would literally get just about every single game that came into the US. Yeah. Uh, and you could do that back then. You could own every game that came out. And we knew, you know, the exciting new games that were coming out and everyone would go out and buy them, you know, all 12 of us or whatever. But, uh, you know, and then in the mid 2000s, I couldn't own every game, but I could play just about every game that came out. Okay. Uh, um, and now I've given up on yeah. on that as well. I mean, I just know there's a ton of stuff that's out there that I really want to do that I just I'm just not gonna get to, or yeah. it's just really really hard. So, you know, without doing it, like you know, Tom Vassell does it pretty much as a job, and he's you know he's he plays all this stuff, and you know, but you know, for me, with the the number of games I get to play plus the play testing I have to do, it's um it's it's just hard. There's only a limited number of new games that I can try. Yeah. Okay, final question is in from Michael Logan, long-time member of my guild. Uh, He very much enjoys Space Cadet's Dice Duel, but he's had a lot of issues getting others to enjoy it. Um, When he's tried it, others have been overwhelmed. Is there an ideal way to introduce the players to the game? Yes. Um, The game to the players. (laughs) Yeah, I've taught Dice Duel well over 100 times at this point between cons and various other things. And yeah, I mean, the, the, the keys in that, and I probably, in retrospect, uh, although I've played it a lot more since we did the rules, but I probably should put this in the rule book. But I would strongly recommend that the first time that you play is take out the tractor beams, take out the crystals, um, and just play with the core stations. And most of the, you know, I find most players, even when I teach the tractor beam rules, um, and allow them to pick up the crystals, which give you special abilities, that even most people don't use them, those those uh, that station anyway, even when I teach it, because there's so much other stuff that's going on. So that that makes it a lot simpler, um, and also reduce the damage that you need to win the game from four to three uh, if you do that, because taking out the tractor beams takes out ways to blow people up. Uh, so um, and and I found with that I can teach the game in five to ten minutes very easily, okay. and uh, and get people going. Uh, yeah. So. It's um that that would be my recommendation. Okay, and the last question from Michael is, which is your favorite and least favorite station on Space Cadets Dice Duel? And Dice Duel, um, or or just on Space Cadets and on Dice Duel? I I don't really well just on Di- I I don't really have a least favorite station. I enjoy them all. Um, I think that um, uh, the I I like the sensors because that's you, you got to kind of counterplay with the other guy. I like the helm because, you know, you can do some really clever stuff with maneuvering and how you come around to the other side of people and see where their unshielded parts of their ships are and make sure that you're you're moving to that area and stuff like that. So, you know, I think they all have their place. Um, the thing that 
always I, I, I always enjoy about dice duel um, is you know if if you play three on for two on two versus two or three versus three it's a team game for those who haven't played it it's a, uh, and it can be two versus two three versus three or four versus four so for t- for two v two and three v three all the players have stations and things that they're doing but when you go to four versus four one person on each team is just the captain and the captain stands behind the team does not manipulate is not allowed to manipulate the components in any way just tells people kind of what to do and helps direct things and comes up with plans and strategies and things. Interesting. And whenever we do that, there's always one person that the, the person that gets appointed to the captain is invariably disappointed <laughs> uh, that they're not going to get to do stuff. And then by the end of the game, they are just like drenched in sweat and they're like, that is the most intense thing I've ever had right. to do. And I, you know, uh, just from standing there and, you know, sweating the details and trying to worry through it, it's, it's an amazing experience to be the captain. And, and you know, it was one of those crazy ideas that we just came up with and said, well, let's try it and see if it works. And, and they did. you know, we had somebody do it and they were like, oh my God, this was awesome. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so 2016, what's your plans regarding games, game design for this year? Um, we've actually, I can't go into details as of yet, but I actually have three games, three new designs under contract, okay. uh, two of which hopefully will be out by Essen, one of which probably won't be out till 2017. Right. So the stuff that you're working on, but you, you can't, you can't say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we're working on that. So, um, hopefully soon we'll be able to, to, to talk about those, but that's, I'm really excited about all of those titles. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got some new stuff, uh, in the hopper as well that, that, uh, that we're working on. And I would love to, I've, I've been bouncing around some ideas of ways to take this legacy concept that you talked about, or this narrative concept and do some, uh, some different things with it. Uh, we've even been talking about trying to come up with a module for time stories. Yep. I remember, yeah, we we were chatting about that on Twitter. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I've I've come up with the idea for a game which has time stories elements, but is there actually a replayable game? Oh, neat. There you go. That's as far as I've got with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't tend to actually make things happen, but I've had a few ideas about it, and I, I've scribbled a few things down on a piece of paper, but I haven't got any further with it. But I just think that would be a, quite a cool idea if it actually worked. But... Um, yeah, lots of ideas, just no, uh, no, no, no time or real ability to do anything about them. So anyway, before you go, I did a competition in my last podcast, um, and I asked uh, a question, which is about the starting player rule for Trickerian, okay, and why I would like it, wh- wh- why it would appeal to me. Um, now, the reason for that, the answer is because in Trickerian, the player who is the starting player is the last one to have worn a top hat. (laughs) And I wore a top hat in my recent Prodigals Club video. So that was the correct answer. Um, I've entered all um, 93 people onto, uh, in, well, I'll say into a hat. I've actually put them in an Excel well, spreadsheet. hat sounds excellently, p- perfectly appropriate for the uh, for the answer to the question. Yeah, if I could get you to pick a number between 1 and 93... I will actually do the draw right here, right now. Okay. So I've got the list in front of me. If you just pick a pick a number. 17. 17. Oh, near the top of the list. Let's have a look. One, two, three, right. 17. Okay. So Geraint Evans will has won the competition. I will I will let him know. Uh, he's won 30 pounds of gaming vouchers, so he can basically wow. buy. Nice whatever he wants so uh, yeah congratulations to Grain and I'll get all the details over to you soon and uh, thanks very much for helping me with that so anything more you want to add before we wrap things up no uh, thank you very much for, for having me on the show um, you know it's if you're interested at all in game design um, I hope that you would enjoy listening to uh, the Ludology podcast over at ludology.net um, and um, you know look look forward to uh, look forward to uh, seeing your game Paul about uh uh, the time stories game with uh, that's completely replayable. I'm I'm ready to see that this year. Get on. Yeah, that. I may I may I may I may just give up on it and decide to share the idea with somebody and hope that they do something <laughs> with it. So that that might be the next step. So anyway, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And that's all for podcast 27. I hope you've enjoyed the show. In podcast 28, I've got another special guest, some random guy from Poland who people probably haven't heard of, and nobody can pronounce his name. That's right, folks. Ignacy Trevishek will be on the show next time round, and I may do another competition too. Thanks again to the show sponsors, Games Law, and to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Take care, and thanks for listening.